Hello, and welcome to the Inclusive Leader Series, a web series that's dedicated to fostering rich discussions around diversity, equity, and inclusion through conversations with chief diversity executives from some of the nation's largest and most respected Fortune 500 organizations. Leading the conversation is Virginia Tech's Vice President for Strategic Affairs and Diversity, Dr. Mena Pratt-Clark. In the few short years that Dr. Pratt-Clark has been at Virginia Tech, she has already established an incredible track record. From leading the campus through an 18-month process, developing a new university-wide strategic plan, to conceptualizing and launching Inclusive VT, Dr. Pratt-Clark is firmly committed to creating a more just and inclusive world, starting right here at Virginia Tech. Joining her is our very special guest, Ayo Odesute, Diversity and Inclusion Lead for Deloitte Consulting. Ayo's role focuses on creating a consistent experience for all employees, ensuring that they are comfortable bringing their authentic selves to work. Ayo is also the Dean of Deloitte Consulting Immersion Program, promoting leadership development for underrepresented minorities. We're so thrilled to hear from these two practitioners and learn from their experiences as we all seek to become better advocates and allies for inclusion and belonging. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today, Io. Uh, I appreciate you being here and our opportunity to have this conversation. Deloitte is such an important university partner, uh, collaborating on so many efforts from an alumni corporate chapter that supports more than 850 Hokie employees to a new mentorship program for first-generation students who are matched with Deloitte practitioners. And so it's just a really wonderful partnership and collaboration. And I'm excited to sit down with you and discuss the importance of advancing the future work, the future of work, um, while making it more just, inclusive, and accessible. So I've got a couple of questions I want to start with, and I think later you'll ask me a few, and we're just going to have um, a conversation today around issues of diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion. Awesome. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start with my, my first question is, um, why is an organization's investment in a diverse and inclusive culture and workforce important? So really asking about what is the business case? Yeah, no, great question to start off. Um, I start by saying that for me, the business case for DEI is, is very personal. I'm African, I'm American, I'm an immigrant, I have an accent. Um, I stand out on so many levels and really haven't always felt like I fit into this image of what a successful business leader looks like. But today I'm a leader in Deloitte Consulting where inclusion is the foundation to, of, of, of our culture and our values. And I can't help but reflect where, where, where I'd be if I, if I didn't work in a more, in, in an inclusive environment, right? I can't help on reflect on how my own unique contributions would have missed, would have been missed, right? If, if I didn't work in an inclusive space. And when you think about that, you have to kind of think about multiplying that by 10 people or hundred and one thousand. Think about all the contributions lost by, by, by not having a more inclusive environment. And I think the data bears this out that a diverse workforce can boost employee engagement, productivity, client service, and innovation. And um, I, I think about two data points. One is a recent Deloitte survey that showed that a diverse thinking workforce actually boosts innovation by about 20% and it reduces risk by about 30%, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And then there's another study that shows that, look, if you have an inclusive environment or you have an inclusive culture, that you are eight times as likely to achieve better business outcomes. So the business case is very compelling uh, when you look at individual experiences as well as what the data shows. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, <laughs> the the defining yourself as an African American. I, I too have defined myself as African American. My father was born in Sierra Leone, Freetown, Sierra Leone, West Africa, and my mother was actually is actually the um, uh, her ancestors were enslaved. And so that connection between Africa and America and the African American identity is really important. And my father had an accent all his life. <laughs> so I do think this immigrant background that many of us bring and yeah. our identities that we bring into the workplace are so important. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so when I first started this work, we were actually calling the work affirmative action. 
actually. And then we moved into multicultural and then we moved into diversity and then into inclusion. And now we, I think these three words of diversity, equity and inclusion are included when we think about this type of work. And maybe you can share a little bit about how you see those words, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, I think we should start by saying, look, this is a journey. We're all learning, like you said, like we're all evolving and we're all expanding our thinking and our understanding of this, this issue. I think equity for us at Deloitte is a recent but extremely important addition to our lingo. We, we always called it diversity and inclusion, and they recently added um, equity to call it diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that word equity is often misconstrued with equality. So well, let me give you, give you, help explain this a little bit. So imagine if we were all sent t-shirts to wear, right? But the t-shirt was all one size, say um, male medium, for example. Now that's equality where everybody gets the same t-shirt, but not everyone can wear that t-shirt, right? Uh, for some, it would be too large. For others, it would be too small. And for many, it wouldn't just fit and they'll stand out and really stand out in not a positive way. So, but I'll ask for us to imagine a world where everybody got the right size t-shirt, mm -hmm. the t-shirt that just fits right. And that's equity. Mm -hmm. Equity fits the system to the people, giving each person the support that they need when they need it. So think about a first generation college graduate getting the support they need, the executive coaching to be successful, or kind of creating mentorship and sponsorship programs for those that are coming to the workplace and may not have that network. And that really is what equity is about. And at Deloitte, we understand that equity is in the process. It's, it's the outcome and the outcome that we will achieve through all the actions we take, actions around diversity, around inclusion, around allyship around anti-ism. And we continually evaluate our systems and processes to determine ways that we can be better, right? To create more equitable and fair experiences for all our people. So that, that's how I think about equity. I like that. I mean, equity does not equal equality, <laughs> right? And that personalized, that understanding the uniqueness of each identity mm -hmm. and each person's humanity and then tailoring an experience for them. I think sometimes in higher ed, we're thinking about this student-centered experience and understanding yeah. the student will learn differently and experience the world differently. And how do we adjust to that as an institution? That, that's spot on. Um, so you talked about this continuum. It's, you know, we never really get there, but we're always trying, adjusting. It's a journey, as yes. you said. And so I wonder, I think you said you've been at Deloitte for almost 15 years, and yeah, I'm sure yeah. you've seen a lot of <laughs> evolution. Maybe you could share a little bit how you've seen that institution in Deloitte evolve over the years. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like, you're right, it's a journey, it's an evolution. When I started, like when I think about Deloitte broadly, right, we were probably the first professional services organization to establish a women's initiative and a diversity initiative. And over the years, we've piloted and launched different programs, trainings, mentorship programs, sponsorship, right? And we've hosted dialogues with our, with our people. But I will say though, that the biggest and mo the, the most momentous change I've seen is last summer right mm -hmm. where it was a turning point for us now say for many companies in america it was just a wake-up call for us all to do more a wake-up call for us to be bolder in our opposition to racism and all forms of bias right bolder in our aspirations for a more inclusive environment and i think what was also different was that that stance came from the top right and it really amped up the transparency and the authenticity with which we started to have conversations across the firm. And it was just so different. The air was different, right? And I know there's some skeptics that will say, look, it's just talk, right? Like we, we've always talked and that talk is cheap, but I've really seen how this talk has changed how people see things, how they think. And they're more mindful about their own personal biases and microaggressions. And I have, I have no doubt that we look, we're heading in the right direction, a more equitable and inclusive environment for everybody. Yeah, we, we I mean, the summer, and, and I, I have mixed feelings about the summer being a, a shifting point because, you know, violence against African-Americans has continued. It's just that it bubbled up in, in very visible ways. Um, but it, it, it has to start with conversations. And, and at Tech, we started conversations as well. We have a series called hashtag VT Unfinished. Mm. And it's about unfinished conversations, largely around race. 
sometimes conversations that never started, conversations that were never finished. And I do think the conversations do lead to actions. And so, um, but I'm curious though, because the conversations are almost ethereal. It's hard to measure. Yeah. And when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's like, as you said, equity is an outcome. Yeah. And so how do you assess success? It's like, are these things working? Are we making a difference? How do you assess that? Yeah, so let me start and maybe uh, kind of transition from the last question to this question, right? Because I do think one of the things I'm really proud of and again, triggered by the events of last summer is that we at Deloitte decided decide to lead, uh, release our first diversity, equity, and inclusion transparency reports, right? And mm -hmm. we made it public, right? And it, it looks at our representation and our current state, both from a quantitative perspective and a qualitative perspective. And it does set some really ambitious goals for what we want our collective future to be. And um, I, I think it, it does provide like a starting point for kind of us to help, for, to help us identify was working well, and but it also shows us that there's there's a lot more work to be done. Mm -hmm. But like just thinking about measurement overall, I, I think that again with measurement, there's an evolution. I think many companies start with just measuring activity mm -hmm. and measuring programs, which is just the easiest thing to do, right? It's um, kind of just measuring all the things that we do. And we at the Lord used to do that a lot. We used to talk about programs mm -hmm. and we measured activity, but not necessarily measuring the outcomes. Right. I do think that we as a firm and corporate America altogether, everybody, we need to shift the conversation of the measurement from measuring activity to actually measuring outcomes. And I think about outcomes in two ways. I think there is the representation, uh, representation outcomes, which is basically kind of just representation of the different groups in the population and at different levels. And I think this is kind of hard quantifiable measures, right? And you have to also measure with the representation acquisition attrition, advancement, right? So, because these are all indicators that will help you ultimately impact representation. I do think there's another outcome to measure though, which is inclusion. And that's a little bit harder to measure. It's, it's saying, how inclusive is your environment? Like, what is your inclusion sentiment? And how do your people feel about their belonging? And can they bring their authentic selves to work? And we at Deloitte measure that through a survey, a talent survey, where we ask people, can you bring your authentic self to work and see how different groups respond to that question. And we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to making sure that that experience is consistent for all our practitioners, irrespective of race, creed, background, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I, I think we are similar. So at, at Virginia Tech, in my role, I actually also oversee the strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. And as part of that work, we developed a new strategic plan about two years ago now. And the plan had four strategic priorities mm -hmm. and 41 metrics and milestones. <laughs> and so to your point about what is measurable, we, it, it was hardcore. It wasn't yeah. programs and activities. We had representational goals for our underrepresented students or underserved mm -hmm. students, for diverse faculty and staff, for research, for fundraising and advancement. I mean, 41 metrics and milestones. So by the time, you know, 2022, 2023, this is where we want to be. Yeah. And every board meeting, you know, once a year, I have the pleasure of saying, this is where we are. This yeah. is where we're going. And we've, you know, danced around 41 is a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, can we find 10 that are core or five that are core? You know, 41 is a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. But if you're trying to get somewhere and these metrics are important, how do you know if you're getting there? And so it's been really wonderful in some ways to say, hey, we're making great progress on our diversity and inclusion goals, for example. Mm -hmm. And others, it's like, we need to really, I mean, we have, um, surveys as well that we use and the survey metrics are part of the the strategic plan okay. so um i think there are a lot of parallels in terms of how we're trying to hold ourselves accountable all right awesome all right cool um so this work even though your role touches on includes a, a dei role it, it can't be done by one person and so we really need to be in community and in collaboration and, and engagement with many others. And I, I wonder who's part of that network of support in, in your role for this work? Yeah, it can be done by, I think it can be done by one person. And I, I think that 
for us or any organization to move the needle on diversity, equity, and inclusion, it has to be a responsibility that we all take. Um, and but 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 maybe a more specific answer is that people who value diversity seek it out, right? And they contribute to it. And I, I think I'm a case in point. I've always valued diversity. And so even 12 years ago, when I was a young manager at Deloitte, I started working with a nonprofit called Management Leaders for Tomorrow, MLT, and uh, which is focused on growing diverse leaders. And we used that partnership to recruit more diverse talents into our firm, right? And we created a community to support them. And they, in return, found this home and sense of belonging and gave back and helped us recruit more. And so we ultimately we created this virtual cycle of bringing in people who kind of were passionate about diversity and inclusion and helped us do more and do more and today MLT is one of our biggest partnerships and we consistently consistently recruit people from that channel so I, I think it's about how do you cultivate people that come into your, your organization how do you tap into their passion and how do you redirect it in ways that um, that are, are productive right but I, I think that's one thing we've done but I think ultimately my philosophy about diversity, equity, and inclusion is that it has to be everybody's responsibility. It can't just be left to me as the BI leader. We all have to be allies in our own various groups. We all have to support other people and use our position of influence and stature to make it easier for other people to succeed. I think that's how we really move the needle. Yeah, it, it is very much that <laughs> building and connecting and the conversations and, and engaging and, and everybody owning it. Yeah, everybody yeah. owns it. Everybody has to own it. Um, I like the story that you shared because it's almost like this example of a little bit of a small effort that turned into a lot of success yeah. and continued to to feed itself in a way. <laughs> so it's sometimes these small gains, and sometimes we don't know where uh -huh. the success will come, but it it sort of builds upon itself. And I'm wondering if you can share other just a few other success stories of how small efforts ended up continuing to make a difference around DEI. Yeah, so I think we have a number of small efforts that are that are going on, right? So one other effort, I think effort we, we, we've made is around sponsorship and mentorship, right? And recognizing that we need to provide um, kind of different groups and to my point about equity, right? How do we provide different groups what they need to be successful? Mm -hmm. And we found that in some pockets of our firm, and we are a large um, firm, um, they've kind of created sponsorship and mentorship programs that have really gained traction mm -hmm. and have helped move the needle around increasing belonging in our firm, right? So to your point, I, I, I often tell people that you know what, the, this diversity, equity, and inclusion journey that we're on, it doesn't have to be big dramatic programs all the time. Sometimes you can make an impact in your own small space, one person at a time, one action at a time, one small program at a time. And we've seen that make a difference in our firm. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because sometimes people say, oh my gosh, this, the world is you know chaotic and what can we do? We can't do anything. But I think knowing that these small steps can really be very transformational if, and sustainable actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I even go go to, to I tell people like it's like it's the everyday actions, right? Like it's it like if, if you ask me what can you do, I'm like, what are you doing on a on a daily basis to support people that are not like you? So take the 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 racial the violence that are against East are against Asians right now, right? Mm -hmm. On your team, have you reached out to people that are of Asian descent to ask them how they're doing, to ask them how they're feeling, right? That is an everyday action that helps people think that, feel like that they belong, right? And, and so that's it, it's all about the everyday actions. It doesn't have to be this big gesture of a program to really make a difference in your neighborhood, in your environment. Yeah, I appreciate that, thank you. And I am acutely aware of the anti-Asian bias and I don't think we talk enough about the Asian community and other identities. We're so focused as a world of so many times on black, white issues that, yes. you know, the Lat Latinx community, the native community, indigenous populations, the Asian population, the LGBTQ community, the Muslim community, there are a lot of communities exactly and identities that, that you know, are, are equally vulnerable in, in society. Agreed. So um, we train students, we, we work with students at Virginia Tech. And so they come into 
almost a sacred sheltered kind of space where it's this, you know, learning environment, it's friendships, it's fun. And then they're in that environment for four years and then boom, they're <laughs> in this corporate world, corporate America. And I wonder if you can, and especially, I'm actually curious about this for even a little bit of a time frame because you've been there for generations. You've seen generations of students. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what, what do you, uh, what do you think students need today to know in order to really be successful in, in the corporate world? Yeah, I miss college. I miss the safety of the four walls of college. <laughs> <Who doesn't? laughs> I think there's just something nice and safe about college. I wish I could go back to my college days, but um, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> so th there, but there is, to your point, there is a transition between kind of college life and corporate life. I think college life is, to your point, it's predictable. There's a roadmap, there's a schedule, there's a game plan. The rules are generally clear on what it takes to be successful. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people succeed in that environment of clarity, right? But I do think that corporate life is often ambiguous, right? Um, there's not necessarily a clear roadmap, a clear game plan. You need to build kind of coalitions and sponsorship and mentorship and support. And I think that ultimately becomes your roadmap. And so there's that difference. And I think the data bears it out. I, I did read a study recently by like the nonprofit MLT that looked at Black and Hispanic ex-MBAs from the top schools, right? And those that joined kind of um, consulting firms and their progression over time. And before they got into consulting, they all had the same similar background experiences, right? Um, similar GMAT scores, um, similar GPAs, and um, similar years of experience. But when they got into corporate America, their progression differed, right? Suggesting that what, it's not rocket science, but suggest that, look, what got you helped to be successful in college, right, not necessarily is the recipe for success in corporate America. And um, I think the point being that in corporate America, you need that sponsorship, you need that mentorship. And I, I think that to, to, to resolve this, I think there is what the employer needs to do, which I've been talking about, right? It's about creating more equity in systems for, every, for everybody, right? Making what's informal for some groups making that formal for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And being deliberate about your actions to orchestrate a more equitable experience, right? So that everybody can be successful. To my point about making the t-shirt fit, right? Mm -hmm. And, but I think for students as well, my guidance is just recognize the game is different, right? Re recognize that it's different, right? And there are different expectations in this and understand what those expectations are. And it's not going to always be easy because the rules are not always written. Like you don't have the rules. You don't have like, here's what you need to get an A, right? So you need to kind of seek out mentors and sponsors to be successful and no one can do it alone, right? I certainly didn't, right? So that, that's my guidance to, to students and to the employees and how to think about su succeeding in the corporate work and uh, corporate place. No, I appreciate that. I remember when I came out of law school and I started practicing law, I mean, I've been a law student. And I was like, whoa, this, this is completely different. Exactly, right? <laughs> Just billable hours and everything. <laughs> that was a whole nother world that I don't think off. I mean, internships help us to prepare, help students to prepare for that yeah. transition. And I just think those internships are, are, are so important. Can you just talk a little bit about the, um, how we can, how colleges and, uh, and universities can help students prepare for diversity issues in the workplace? Yeah, so I think it's about, so I, I think there are two things, right? I, I think that we need to prepare both the diverse candidates and everybody else, right? I think it's, it's two pronged. I think for um, diverse candidates, whether it's Black, Hispanic, I think it's just training and education about the, the reality of what they're going into and how they have to maybe in some cases go a step further to, um, to, 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 to succeed. So what I mean by that is for me personally, one of the challenges I faced coming to the workplace was that I was shy I wasn't always the one to put myself out there and talk about and build a network. And I wasn't the one to kind of toot my own horn. And I had to recognize that about myself and my background and my upbringing and let myself know that 
to be successful, I need to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a level of education that's required to help them understand that, yeah, okay, that's fine, that's who you are, but this is the workplace, this is a game, mm -hmm. and to be successful, you may need to do things a little bit different. So that, that's one. And I think for the general population, I think it's important to educate on allyship, right? And educate everybody on what it means to be an ally to other vulnerable communities, right? And I think ultimately, if universities do that, uh, we can start to really make significant impact in, in the near future. Yeah, I, I think that it's, I mean, this corporate world, there, there's unwritten games, <laughs> unwritten <laughs> rules, yeah. unwritten rules of the game yeah. and being able to learn the rules informally through conversations. I love your emphasis on sponsorship and mentorship. I do think that those are really very important and, and, you, and, and having to shift ourselves a little bit, being willing to step outside of our comfort zone exactly. so that we can succeed in, in maybe spaces that weren't originally designed for us to succeed, but are wanting us now to succeed. Exactly. Well said. Well said. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for your insight. <laughs> All right, Mena, um, great conversation so far. Thanks for all those questions and, and, and all. Um, it's now my time to ask you a few questions. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let me start by saying, look, there's a, there's a common misconception that diversity training is all we need. We see that there's a lot of training out there. We know training increases awareness, but that's really not enough to change culture. So from your perspective, what are some of the things you do at Virginia Tech to drive meaningful change and what successes have you seen? Yes, I, I mean, I do think, I, I like to call it diversity education because it allows the education to stay embedded in our mission as our higher ed institution. It, it, and it's one key critical step, um, but it's not all, as, as mm -hmm. you said. And what I'm really pleased about, I would say, mm -hmm. at Virginia Tech is that our diversity efforts are called Inclusive VT. It's called Inclusive VT. Mm -hmm. And it's the institutional and individual commitment to our motto. And our motto is Ut Prosum that I may serve mm -hmm. in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence. And so we have this concept that's both at the institutional level and the individual level, and it's connected to our motto, which is a commitment to serving the world, serving humanity. And as part of Inclusive ET, we've identified four goals. And the first one actually is sustainable institutional transformation. So it forces us as an institution, everything we do, is this sustainable? So it's not based on whether Mena is, you know, here at Virginia Tech or whether Bob or Sally or Jane or Juan or whoever. It's, it's embedded within the institution yeah. and it's sustainable because I've seen historically so many diversity efforts have been contingent upon one person who was passionate, who led a program, who made significant change. And then when that person left, the program yeah. sort of lost its momentum. And so this concept of sustainability is one of the key priorities of Inclusive ET. And then the others are representational diversity, which you also spoke about, mm -hmm. climate, um, making sure we have a welcoming, affirming, safe and accessible climate. And then that we integrate diversity into the academic mission in terms of uh, the education mission of the institution that we're talking about issues of equity, humanity, and identity. And so because we have this overarching framework, we have encouraged every college, every unit to look at it at that local level. How is your structure sustainable? What is your structure? Yeah. What are your representational goals again? talked a little bit about our strategic plan that has these 41 metrics and milestones. So what are you doing? Um, what are your goals? How are you advancing the university's goals? And then continuing to provide an infrastructure support. So I think our office, we see ourselves as being a catalyst mm -hmm. for supporting the development of the cultural competency of the institution. Mm -hmm. So we, we serve as that central point of coordination with decentralized accountability. And so it's that structure that I really feel good about because uh -huh. it's got a fundamental connection to our mission and our motto, Ut uh -huh. Prosum, service. And then we connect the importance of service to being able to serve anybody at any time, anywhere. And in order to do that well, you need to understand people, their identities, their backgrounds and experiences. That is awesome. And, and I think, 
for us at Deloitte, one of the things we've, we've struggled with that question about, look, you have to do more than just education, right? Mm -hmm. And what we've actually pushed ourselves to do right now is go from just sharing data to holding our leaders accountable mm -hmm. for that, right? In a way, because what gets measured is what matters, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and we realize that, look, we're a corporation and if it gets measured, then people will change their behavior. So there is a point that, that there's only, education can only take you so far, um, but you do need to hold your leaders accountable and other people accountable to actually deliver on those outcomes. So that's something we're doing as well at our, at our firm. Yeah, I think this issue of accountability is really interesting because I tell people all the time, let's be really careful when we think about who and what office and what unit we're talking about accountability to. I mean, I don't, I don't recruit students. I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't admit students. Yes. You know, yeah. I don't hire faculty. Um, I'm responsible for the climate in my unit, not the climate of the university. Everybody's responsible for mm -hmm. the climate in their own unit. Mm -hmm. Whoever is admitting students needs to be held accountable. Whoever is hiring faculty needs to be held accountable. And so I, I'm very intentional in thinking about who, what, what is the office for inclusion and diversity responsible for? What is everybody else responsible for? And let's make sure we hold them accountable as well. Bingo, music to my ears. Because I, I think we also think about it the same way about role-based accountability. Like what is your role and yeah. what can you influence? And let's hold you accountable for that, right? So that's exactly right. So yeah. makes sense. Um, so shifting gears a little bit. So I like I and D takes attention along the full continuum from pre-college through to engagement with alumni after graduation and everything in between. Um, how does Inclusive VT and your office support success along this full continuum? Where are the biggest opportunities to do more? You know, it, it is a continuum and it, and it starts, at, you know, even you spoke about a pre-K through 12 yeah. and it, it, there's talent there. And, and, you know, to your first comment about where do we lose talent? We, we, we're losing talent all along the way. And so how do we as an institution, and we're a land grant, which in my mind, it's, it's serving the citizens of the state. Yeah. So this, this big responsibility to actualize potential. And so we have to have programs K-12 and you can't get people to think about Virginia Tech if you're not talking to them at, at some point in that K-12 continuum. And I have seen, we started a black college institute about three years ago. And the purpose was that we were hearing from African-American students, like Virginia Tech is very far away. You know, we're, we're kind of on this, you know, Eastern side of the state and you're four to five hours away. And we think it's in a small town in Southwest Virginia and well, we're not so sure. And so you have to sell your institution. You have to market your institution. You have to tell a story about your institution that will allow students to become interested. And so when we started the Black College Institute, we essentially said, we want you to see Virginia Tech. Come, come, see, our, come see our school that we are so in love with, but we want you to love it too. We want you to think about becoming a Hokie. And so we started with rising juniors and rising seniors and said, come spend a week with us and we will show you in every college what we have to offer. And that program has been tremendous. I mean, there's about 400. We did it last year virtually. It will be virtual again this year. It's not quite the same, but it introduces almost 450 students, largely African-American, but it's not limited to African-American students. It focuses on the African-American experience, but it exposes students, 450 or so students to Virginia Tech. And from that, we recruit them. So it has become a really wonderful pipeline. And applications this year from African-American students, I think are up 75%. African applications from Hispanic students are up about 60%. We've doubled applications from native students because we have efforts that are also with tribal communities mm -hmm. because we have 11 tribal communities, tribal nations in, in Virginia. And so being sensitive to where is the talent, it's, 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 it's a competition for talent with students, with faculty, so we have faculty diversity efforts. Um, and then it's this relationship with our alumni. And mm -hmm. so these partnerships with Deloitte and having a Deloitte chapter and 850 Hokie alums, I think is just a very powerful example mm -hmm. of the importance of relationships with people. I think it always goes back to people and their relationships with one another and how you develop. I mean, so many people talk about, I came to so-and-so place or institution because I knew a person. 
Yeah. And it was a connection with a recruiter or a friend of a friend or, or someone. And so these personal relationships across the continuum from and relationships with the parents as well. So the Black College Institute, for example, engages the parents because parents are instrumental in the decisions of their students. So I, I think it is. It's, it's a sensitivity to where are the people, where is the talent and what do you need to do to be in touch just to have a conversation with the talent. Yeah. Yeah. So at, at Deloitte, and I'm sure other competitions, other corporations will say this, that it is a war on talent, right? Just like mm -hmm. you said, right? We, 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 we want to hire and recruit more diverse candidates, but like there are only so many of them out there um, and everybody wants them, right? So there is a war on diverse talent right now. And so I'm just wondering, and you talked about partnerships and, and partnerships, right? What, what more can companies like Deloitte and others do to increase the pipeline, to increase the talent base so that we are not all fighting for the single black talent that's out there. Yes, this, the experience, and, and this is I think an American problem, sadly, but we, we, we haven't been intentional in supporting K-12 education and supporting that educational environment and the students in those spaces. And I think if there are better ways for corporations to talk about and to engage and to support teachers. So when you think about just a teacher dealing with <laughs> a classroom of 30 children, and what would it mean to have more parents be able to have flexible time to spend a few hours, to go on field trips, to support teachers in the learning experience. And I remember when my children were younger, I went on a field trip on a bus. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what the teacher deals with every day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wow. Let me. And I think the pandemic has made parents realize, oh my goodness, this is the educational experience that our children are, are trying to participate in. And this one person, We've tasked one person with 25, 30, 35, 40 students at all very different levels of ability and capacity. And some students are coming in less prepared, even at younger ages. Yeah. And so how do we think about equity at that level? Because you start having children drop out, be less prepared for Virginia Tech at very early ages. So if you haven't been prepared, and even you know in the state of Virginia, you have the high school diploma and you have another credential. And depending on which one you get, you're going to be more likely to succeed in college. And so ninth grade is too late to, to be having that conversation. So I think companies need to be starting to embed themselves more in partnerships with schools to adopt schools, to have a conversation with the school, the school system. What do you need? Who are the students that mm -hmm. are not making it? And how do we partner with those students, with those families to understand what their challenges and, and trials are that we can support them as a company? So I think the resources from a corporation, the people resources, can make a big difference in communities of students who get left behind and, and are dropout. And I, I think that intentionality of starting those conversations really across America in my mind, because I think the K-12 is a very vulnerable space that we haven't prioritized as a nation and, and that we really have opportunities to do a lot more there. Okay, no, that, that's helpful. And so basically we have to start earlier and yeah. it, it's, a, it's a broader problem, so. All right, um, another question for you. Now, now that we are all working from home for the foreseeable future, so many of the strategic initiatives I had in mind look completely different, right? Um, so we, a lot of things that we're doing, we have to now do virtually. Our training is all virtual. We can't do anything in person. We can't create the experiences that we want. Um, the needs of staff, and I presume students are changing and perhaps worsening, right? So question, how has the pandemic shifted your priorities, your strategic priorities at Virginia Tech and what needs and opportunities have emerged for you? It's a really interesting question because it's complex. Because on one hand, March last year came and everybody got sent home. It's like, go home. And all of a sudden, you know, conversations that would have taken years, it's like, you're doing online learning in two weeks. You know, <laughs> shift your curriculum, learn Zoom and get it to work. And so all of a sudden there was a new way of learning in the world. 
that some institutions, there are other institutions who have been doing online learning for a long time, but are sort of stayed in the, you know, historical institutions of a land grant large school. It's like you come in person for this in person interaction and the relationships. And so on one hand, yes, that's a wonderful thing. Because as a land grant, if we're trying to serve the citizens of the state, we presumably can serve more because we can serve more in a virtual space, maybe in, as things shift, continuing to serve more in person. But it, it's making us think about it. It's like, okay, how do we deliver our educational experience? We can deliver it in different platforms, in different ways. What do we still value? Do we still value the freshmen coming on campus, living in the residence hall, joining fraternity, sorority, student organizations, and having that life? How do we support that? But are there students that we could serve who can't do that, who don't want to do that? So what does that mean for space and buildings? We're all in our homes, and we were all worried about space. And now there's a bunch of physical buildings not being really used. So how to re reimagine and repurpose office spaces if in fact employees can successfully work from home? But what do you lose in employees working from home? What do you lose in that hallway chatter that doesn't happen or the, hey, what's up? Or how's your family? You know, it's like teams and chatting on the side doesn't quite get the, how you doing that eye to eye, that face to face contact and not wanting to minimize that to say, hey, we can do everything on Zoom, let's, let's just keep going. Uh -huh. So I think it's just raising a lot of questions. I don't think we have answers. The, the other thing that I think we're all gonna be challenged with that we're not prepared for, I think as a society, is the mental health implications of the isolation. You know, you have employees who have children that they've been raising and schooling and you know, this, this isolation losses, people who have lost family members to the pandemic. And there's a lot of just mental health challenges for students, for employees. And I'm not sure we really have the resources to begin to provide the support that's needed. And so I'm not sure what type of students, high school students who yeah. now have spent, you know, the last year they're learning in this different way and then they come to college. I mean, we've taken away the socialization uh -huh. in many ways. And so I, I think we're gonna be learning. I, I don't think we have a good answer to what's next. Yeah, what's next is like, who knows, right? But I, I, your call out about the mental health issue that it already exists and will potentially continue to exist for a while to come is so important. And I think as a firm, we are becoming more aware of it and trying to provide our teams with the resources and also trying to have real honest conversations about it, right? Because I do think that there's often a stigma around mental health. And so people don't really share what it is. And obviously it's not binary. There is a whole spectrum of mental well-being. And I do, I remember I, I was on one of those in one of those conversations where we talked about it and I reflected on the spectrum that was shared. I was like, you know what, I, I can see how it is. Like I'm not all the way to the right, but the isolation, the stress, the constant Zoom calls, I am definitely not on the left. I'm not, I'm not wholly okay, right? So and I think I, we, we've now found the lingo to be able to talk about it more openly. And I do think that more companies should do that uh, because again, to your point, conversations create awareness and then that awareness then helps us come up with solutions yeah okay all right now this has been a great conversation i've learned so much and um i wonder if there was maybe one key message that you hope that um deloitte alum and the greater Hokie nation can take away from this conversation well i guess i would say that I just have a deep love for virginia tech uh, a deep pride for the institution and the mission of Oop Prosum has always resonated with me. It's why I came, that I may serve. And I love the idea that as an institution, we're trying to prepare students to be leaders, to be leaders though who are prepared to serve anyone at any time and anywhere, this concept of the inclusivity difference, and that we're preparing students to have a sensitivity about issues of identity, issues of humanity, issues of, 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 of equity caring deeply about other people and committing in a way to a life of service to make a difference. And so I think 
the partnership with Deloitte is really a wonderful partnership with companies who share similar values and vision and mission and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and making a difference in the world. And so I think the takeaway for me is that these um, corporate institutional partnerships with higher ed institutions are invaluable. We want our students to have employment opportunities, but we also want to gain from understanding what world, how we need to be preparing students. We're preparing students for, for the workforce and we need to have an understanding of what the workforce needs so that our students are prepared. And I think for me, this conversation has really been wonderful and affirming, like, okay, we're kind of on the right track. Maybe we can do better in some ways, but I, I think we're on the right track. So thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. Just again, um, insightful for me in my role as kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion leader to kind of think about where the talent is coming from, what we need to do differently or in partnership with yourselves in, in, in Virginia Tech. So this has been very, very insightful and I thank you for your time. I thank you too. And I look forward just to, to our continued partnership and relationship. Thank All you. Right. Awesome, take care. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this conversation and series will be a reinforcement for students, alumni, and all Hokies to positively represent themselves in their professions and communities. To learn more about Inclusive VT and other programs supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion at Virginia Tech, check out our website at www.inclusive.vt.edu. We hope you'll join us next time.